This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. How can we prepare for a future wholly unlike the past we've known? We need to come together to understand the risks, understand our vulnerabilities, and then start making decisions with the support and the aid of the federal government to have better outcomes. We have proven examples of resilient solutions, but they take time, money, and foresight. Our country, uh, when put to task, can build a system that can reduce risk. We can't protect people from climate change, but we can reduce the risk. Despite increasingly severe storms and sunny day flooding, the mayor of Miami says continued waterfront development isn't crazy. I think there are some that, for whatever reason, feel that Miami will not exist in 10 years or in 20 years or in 100 years. And that's you know certainly not an acceptable outcome for me. How do we prepare for the disasters we don't want to think about? Before we get into our conversation on building climate resilience, we're continuing our weekly spotlight on the upcoming International Climate Summit in Glasgow. The day after the 2020 presidential election, the U.S. exited the Paris Climate Agreement, a non-binding international framework to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and keep a lid on global warming. The decision to quit the Global Climate Accord dented U.S. credentials as a reliable partner in the fight against climate disruption. Can the Biden administration undo the damage and reestablish the nation's reputation at this year's COP26? Climate One correspondent Aman Azar reports. Former President Trump's decision to unilaterally and abruptly quit the Paris Agreement created doubts about whether the U.S. can be a reliable partner in the fight against climate crisis. As the world leaders prepare for COP26 in Glasgow, the need for fully engaged global climate leadership couldn't be more important. So how can Washington signal it really is back as a trusted partner on the climate agenda? Well, I think there's three things that the the US really needs to do. The first is domestically, it needs to take um, measures that would bind successor administrations. The analogy would be the UK's attempt, which is to set up a climate act that binds successive governments and provides an independent oversight of that. That's Duncan McLaren, professor in practice at Lancaster University's Environment Center. He says it's a bit like handing over control of interest rates to a central bank rather than keeping them in the purview of the president or the government. He suggests two other ways the U.S. can prove its image as a climate partner. The second is to demonstrate a commitment to climate justice. And that means investing in the most vulnerable communities, both domestically and internationally. And the third thing the US government needs to do is very explicitly reject the the false solutions that are out there. And there's two I'd mention in particular. The idea that we can do this through carbon trading and similarly the idea that we can wait for technologies of solar geoengineering. But David Orr, the Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies at Oberlin College, argues the influence of the fossil fuel industry on American politics contributes to the U.S. backpedaling on climate issues. It's awfully hard for the United States to maintain a commitment to any kind of climate mitigation with the power of fossil fuel money in the U.S. Senate, in U.S. Congress, and in local elections. The real step is a a transformation of U.S. politics that simply removes oil money from our our politics. Orr says the U.S. needs to take steps at home and abroad to demonstrate its seriousness to the world community. We need to resolve our own doubts about this. And the climate denial community, which has flourished in the United States for a long time, needs to be put to rest. Second thing, on policy level, historically, the U.S. is the largest emitter. And I think that imposes on us certain obligations to A, reduce our own carbon emissions and B, help the rest of the world do that. But U.S. politics is a complex web of competing interests. Powerful members of the ruling Democratic Party, such as Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, don't support the Biden administration's historic climate spending. Manchin can't stop the U.S., for instance, going to the COP and saying, yeah, in the past we've we've we may have looked like we're in bed with Saudi Arabia and, and keeping fossil fuel taps open. Well, we want to disown that position. 
we're not going to do that in the future, then that, that would help in, in terms of making the COP look more open to the solutions we need, which are to turn off the taps of the, the fossil fuel industry. McLaren and Orr agree that given the uncertain US politics, America's allies would be at best cautiously optimistic about its return to the climate table. But they warn of what a continued trust deficit could mean for global climate negotiations. What would worry me is the sense that, that we're in an era that without coordinated um, work through the, the COP system, we'll see further destabilization and fragmentation. Um, the global great powers each developing their own sort of strategies for climate securitization. We would see, I think, measures like geoengineering coming on the table. We'd see countries developing, if you like, climate-adapted enclaves for the rich, constraining immigration further than they do now, repressing climate activism. It's not a pretty picture. Climate change requires that the world come together. So uh, this is a time for leadership. If we don't provide it, other people will. And I think in the geopolitics of the world, uh, that is an open door to uh, China taking the place of the United States. And that's, uh, I think, not good for the world. A firm U.S. commitment to this global partnership at COP26 will be crucial for a coordinated response in the face of the increasingly urgent climate emergency. For Climate One in Washington, D.C., this is Aman Azar. The Climate Summit in Glasgow follows extreme weather events that will become more common. Heat domes, massive wildfires, superpower storms, and extreme rainfall. Like the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change is a threat multiplier. Tom Bostick is former commanding general of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He led the Hurricane Sandy response and recovery efforts and says we should take disasters like that as opportunities to better prepare for the next ones. In her new book, The Fight for Climate After COVID-19, Alice Hill says we need to adapt our thinking and our policies to combat the ever-increasing threat of climate disruption. Hill worked on climate issues at the Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Council in the Obama administration. She's now a senior fellow for climate change policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Hill says shortly after she arrived at the Obama White House in 2013, a senior official on the National Security Council stopped by her office and gave her a warning. Someone stood in my doorway and said, you're getting a reputation. I said, a reputation for what? He said, for worrying too much about climate change. And of course, I took that in and I realized that that probably signaled the person and the whoever else was saying this just simply didn't understand the nature of climate risk, how it's accelerating, growing, and will affect everything eventually. That's quite startling in the second Obama term when climate was a, a big issue. So what did that say to you that even a high-ranking government official in the White House didn't understand in 2014 the extent of climate risk? It said to me that we have a climate literacy gap among leaders, and that's true both in government as well as in the private sector. And that gap in knowledge, it's understandable. It hasn't been taught in schools uh, as required curricula. So it's not surprising that leaders don't know much about climate change. And you could underestimate it if you don't know a lot about it. There's another root of that comment is how people perceive risk, which you write is partly a function of how quickly an example of risk comes to mind, you know, how recent and relatable it is. So compare the risks of climate and COVID-19 and how you think humans perceive those threats. Well, both of them are threats that are catastrophic, uh, but with pandemics, history has been teaching us that a pandemic could occur. We had the flu in 1918. We've had the plague in the 14th century. So that's part of the narrative that people learn about. With climate change, these are risks that have never occurred in human history, completely unfamiliar, and therefore, turns out our brains, and the social scientists tell us this, aren't particularly good at judging how bad that risk could get. 
Right. There's kind of a human tendency. If it hasn't happened before, it can't happen, Tom. But we know that there are lessons from the past. And you often refer to Hurricane Betsy, which hit New Orleans in 1965, breaching levees and inundating several neighborhoods. What are the lessons of Hurricane Betsy and how do they relate to Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Ida that just slammed Louisiana and the Northeast? Well, one thing about disasters is after a major disaster, it presents an opportunity for the country at the federal level and the local level to do something. So after Hurricane Betsy in 1965, uh, the Corps of Engineers was directed to build a hurricane protection system. And by the time Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, 40 years later, we were about 50 percent complete. And part of the challenge with that is uh, setting priorities, uh, the lack of ability to set priorities. And on any given day, the Corps has about 3,000 projects. Uh, We received a certain amount of appropriations every year, and that money is spread like peanut butter over these projects. But after Hurricane Katrina and the disaster that was caused then, and the federal government invested about $135 billion in the recovery effort, $14.5 billion went to the Corps of Engineers. And the Corps of Engineers calls the project that's there the Hurricane and Storm Damage Risk Reduction System, HISDRS. It's not a very good name, but one word that's not in there is protection, because we really cannot protect life and and property against certain storms. We reduce the risk. And in 2012, seven years to the day after Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Isaac hit. And most people don't know about Isaac, uh, but it had storm surges of 12 to 14 feet, which is pretty significant. And the storm system uh, did its job down there. And similarly with Hurricane Ida, most folks that have seen the system up close and personal during this last storm realize that that the system worked. So our country, uh, when put to task, can, can build a system that can reduce risk. We can't protect people from climate change, but we can reduce the risk. Right. And and so it worked for, for Isaac and does seem to have worked for Ida, though those levees are sinking and will need more work to continue uh, protecting the city. So are you saying that the dynamics change with the Army Corps, that they're no longer spreading peanut butter, that they're kind of concentrating their efforts more more focused and therefore getting better results? Well, I think uh, we've received a significant amount of money from the Congress, and and that money combined with the local level is helping us to put an adequate uh, amount of funds in that area. But but with sediment uh, sediment issues with um, the the sea level rise and and, and the storm surges, we're going to continue to see a need for that part of the country to consider what options they have 10, 20, 50 years into the future. Right. We're, we're buying time with uh, big price tags. Alice, the recent IPCC report warned of compound events, one disaster on top of another, wildfires and power outages, a hurricane and a pandemic. The convergence of big disasters are stretching FEMA to the breaking point. So how can communities build resilience to come back after a double or triple whammy like we're seeing right now? Well, there are a number of ways. Uh, First of all, they need to plan and they need to account for the future risk of climate change. But also we need to focus on our emergency management. It's a different game now. With the pandemic, we saw all 50 states and six territories hit at once. FEMA never contemplated having to respond in that way before, but now we know a drought Uh, may cause or contribute to a wildfire. And then following the wildfire, there might be a mudslide. So all of that causes greater damage to communities than we're familiar with. And we need greater surge capacity. That is a faster response that can cover more territory all at once to help communities withstand the impacts and then recover from them. So it could be having more capability for fighting wildfires, more planes available. It could be having a resilience core, as Paris has created, of citizens who could go out and help 
post-disaster, make sure that recovery goes as smoothly as possible. It also means strengthening our supply chains. As we have learned during the pandemic, we can't assume that these really thin supply chains that are like a net across the globe are going to hold during multiple catastrophes. General Bostic, you've talked about how the, the Army Corps has learned some lessons um, uh, from recent, you know, Katrina, et cetera. After Katrina, the head of the Army Corps, Chief uh, Carl Strock, retired because the system designed to protect New Orleans actually worsened the damage there. Um, as Alice Hill talks about all these multiple and compounding disasters that are happening and on broader scale than people imagined before, what does that mean for, for how the Army Corps thinks about his work? And you might describe you know, a little bit of explainer for people who aren't exactly familiar with the Army Corps does other than maybe dredging ports and other things? The Army Corps of Engineers has is, is been around since before the country was even formed. The Corps of Engineers has been imminently involved uh, in the growth of our, our nation. But the Corps has two parts. It's got a civil part and it's got the military part. And the military part of the Corps of Engineers uh, works on military installations. They deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. One thing I wanted to talk about, uh, in addition to what Alice discussed on, on resilience, I think of one of the best lessons of resilience we learned, uh, again, back after the flood of 1927. The flood of 1927 was really a, a bad flood. It, it caused huge issues for the country uh, particularly in the New Orleans and, and along the Mississippi River. And the Corps of Engineers was directed once again by Congress to build the Mississippi Rivers and Tributary System. And it's a system of, of locks and devi, levees uh, throughout the Mississippi that will help control the river um, and control flooding. But risk is all about fighting against uh, some sort of impact. Resilience is accepting the fact that you're going to have to give way. You're going to have to fail somewhere in the system, but bounce back and bounce back even stronger. So, so what happened in, in 2011, a huge uh, amount of water came down the Mississippi. And if anybody remembers that flood in 2011, they remember a two-star general blowing up the levee just south of St. Louis. We don't call it blowing up the levee in the Corps of Engineers. We say we operated the floodway. And what we did is we had dynamite in this one area where we knew that would be so much pressure along the Mississippi that if we blew up the levee or operated the floodway, we would open up a five mile wide, 65 mile uh, long area where the water could, it was a relief valve. The water could just pour into this area and then it would save lives and save property uh, down through the Mississippi. Well, and some people hearing that story, uh, Tom Bosick, might say, well, that's returning nature to the way it was and the way it should be, that there's been kind of this, uh, you know, trying to channel rivers and, and this kind of arrogance of trying to control nature through steel and concrete, which gets to the point of um, thinking about the Army Corps has often thought about structures on heavy, on steel and concrete. What other ways can use nature to uh, build resilience and that might displace concrete in other ways we've been approaching nature in the last few decades. You know, the Corps never raises its hand and says, I want to do this mission. I, I've got a great idea. Let me go build this dam or build this levee. What we do is what the American people want. And an interesting story I think about is when I was a young major, I was the aide to the chief of engineers. And we flew down to a project that was called Kissimmee, the Kissimmee River Project, where the local residents in the state wanted to turn this river into basically a culvert that would move the water faster and, and they'd have control of it for irrigation and other purposes. We thought and explained that that would kill the environment that would depend on that, the, that river. Years later, I'm the chief of engineers and I go back down to the Kissimmee River and they're beating up on the Corps of Engineers for building this culvert and they want us to change it back. So that's what we did. And what had happened in those years since I was a major to becoming the chief engineers, society, our, the people of America, became more environmentally conscious. They started to uh, really appreciate what the natural environment and the benefits of the natural environment gave to them. So the Corps spends a lot of time thinking about 
living shorelines and, and ecosystem restoration? And what are the kind of things that we can do in concert with the other priorities that we have in the core, which are flood risk management and, and navigation? You're listening to a Climate One conversation about preparing for future climate disasters. Coming up, the crucial importance of planning and preparing for future crises. Part of the challenge is that we're often very short-term focused and climate change happens over time. The challenge is by the time it hits you, there's almost not much left that you can do. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One, and we're talking with Tom Bostick, former commanding general of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and Alice Hill, who worked on climate change issues at the Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Council in the Obama administration. Hill advocates for a nationally coordinated government approach to adaptation to climate change. But as we've seen with the COVID pandemic, fractured politics can make a mess of these things. I asked her how we can overcome that. We are fractured, and that makes it difficult uh, when some are not convinced about the severity of climate change. But despite that division in our politics, the one thing that we can do is start planning. And what needs to happen now is the federal agencies must begin to focus on what does climate risk mean for their particular mission set, be it at the Department of Homeland Security, which is responsible for our borders and with Coast Guard, our waterways, or the Army Corps of Engineers and their responsibilities that you've heard about, or HUD in its responsibilities for helping uh, provide housing. All of these agencies need to come together uh, and they need a framework that will allow them to have not only a whole of government approach to this growing risk, but also a whole of society. We need to come together to understand the risks, understand our vulnerabilities, and then start making decisions with the support and the uh, aid of the federal government to have better outcomes, more resilience, as Thomas said. General Bostic, you said that the Army Corps spreads money like peanut butter thinly across the whole country. Uh, there used to be federal earmarks, which were, you know, some called it pork funding that would individual members of Congress can bring home to their constituents. That was eliminated some years ago. Uh, it's gradually making a comeback. Do you think that would help uh, set priorities for uh, national priorities, which you said the Army Corps doesn't do? Well, the court has has a hand in setting priorities. They must work with the, the federal government, to, which does the authorization and the appropriations, and then also with the states who cost share a lot of these projects. But I think the priorities is, is a very important part of this equation. But, but going back to what Alice was speaking about, we have to come together as a nation, and it's got to be the public sector and the private sector all working together in a systematic way to address the challenges that we face. I don't like disasters, but I've been around for a number of them. And one of the things I, I do like is how the nation comes together after them. I saw what we did after Katrina and then uh, Superstorm Sandy. And, and, and climate change is an international systematic uh, challenge that we have to take on as an entire system. Tom, you say that no one wants to talk about retreat or what's often called managed retreat. Uh, what is that and why don't people want to talk about it? Part of the challenge, I think, and is that we're often very short-term focused and climate change happens over time. The challenge is by the time it hits you, there's almost not much left that you can do. One of the great things I, I think that came out of Superstorm Sandy is the Congress said, Corps of Engineers, we want you to do a study of the Northeast Coast, 31,500 miles of, uh, of coastline. We want you to look out 50 to 100 years and, and do an analysis and, and, and come back and, and let America know what we should be doing. So we brought some of the best minds and organizations together, uh, provided this report. The budget was for about $20 million, provided it after a year on time and within budget. And part of it came back to we needed resilient communities. And, and, and we looked at things like, like uh, barrier islands and, and 20 to 25 years from now, some of these barrier islands are going to be underwater. So the question is, if you have a home there, 
you don't see that. You're not feeling 20 to 25 years, but your children will. And the kind of decisions that have to be made include retreat in, in my mind, but, but it's a hard thing to do. And I can appreciate how hard it is because it's the livelihood, it's the history, it's, it's everything to people. If, if you tell them they have to leave a certain coastline community or barrier island. Alice, how do you think about that? There's some very difficult decisions to be made about which communities are protected. There's a bias toward protecting high property values, which which means lower income neighborhoods with less property value are less likely to get public resources. How do you think about managed retreat as uh, climate hits harder and harder along water lines? Look, this is going to be a really tough challenge uh, for everyone. And we have to put ourselves in the shoes of those who might have to move away from risk. It could be in a wildfire zone or it could be a coastal zone, a riverine, a river along a river's edge. And that's a very emotional decision to ask people to leave their homes, their communities, the people they love, and to move somewhere else. It's a conversation, however, that the federal government has an important role to play because it, that Retreat or movement could happen very suddenly, as it happened with a wildfire in California. Uh, After Paradise burned, 20,000 people moved into the town of Chico overnight, a town with about 100,000 people and population. So imagine, the kindergartens are all, all of a sudden filled. Affordable housing, which was already unaffordable, becomes even more unaffordable. The streets are clogged. So we need to plan which communities will be the receiving communities. More people are moving into areas that are at flood risk and fire risk than other areas. So can the federal government give incentives to help people understand that investment, your primary investment in your home, may not be so wise, as Thomas said, in 20 years? But Ellis Hill, you've been talking there all about policy and government. What's the role of markets? I'm amazed that banks are still writing mortgages on uh, waterfront uh, condominiums in certain places. I wonder you know, what the banks are thinking if they're writing 15, 30-year mortgages. Somebody's going to get left financially holding the bag. So where are the financial incentives? This isn't just a government responsibility to, to give people signals about where it's risky to live and where they, they might move. Well, I think it's uh, Sir Nicholas Stern who said that climate change is the biggest market failure ever. Uh, And uh, certainly we are seeing some market failures. We can look at two risks, flood or fire. Uh, And let's start with fire in California. California has seen a retreat uh, by private insurers. They do not want to insure in those areas. The California Department of Insurance, the commissioner has said, To those insurance companies, no, you can't leave the state or you can't stop offering uh, renewals to people that live near fires. The commissioner in California has done that three years running. At some point, he can't keep doing that because that means people are underpaying for the risk that that they're living in, right? Exactly. Why do the insurance companies want to leave? Because they don't think that they can offer a policy at a price that someone, a homeowner is interested in that covers this growing risk of wildfire. So the risk and the market signals are getting very uh, out of kilter. Same thing in flood. In the 60s, we had some big floods. Private insurers said, you know what? We're really not so interested in insuring for flood anymore. Congress said, hey, we'll come in and we're going to create a national flood insurance program. That program is widely viewed as basically bankrupt uh, and unable to charge the types of prices that match the risk. And so not surprisingly, people move in greater numbers in areas at risk because they can get subsidies for insurance. And we're just not having the market signals yet that we need to move away. General Bostic, Miami is a high-risk area that is still promoting oceanfront development. Uh, you know, we talk in this episode with Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. There's a, in the news recently a big plan to build a big wall uh, through downtown Miami to protect it from uh, sea level rise. People there naturally want to pr- protect tourism, protect property values. Talk to us about what the Army Corps choices are in, in uh, defending Miami that wants to keep things the way they are, but doesn't want a big, ugly wall. Yeah, well, it, that's a tough, tough question. And I wasn't involved in, in these sorts of discussions, but I'm sure 
what the core talked about is uh, the importance of resilience and the importance of the fact that you cannot defend against certain storms. There's going to be a storm bigger than Katrina. There's going to be a storm bigger than Ida. Um, there's going to be a storm bigger than any wall that you can design and build for today uh, sometime in the future. So part of what you have to build in any risk reduction system is the ability to develop resilience in the system. Where is there going to be give? Right. And the community did come back with less concrete and more barrier islands and kind of using nature as a, as a buffer. Uh, so that process is underway. One thing, Alice Hill, that Florida did do is after Hurricane Andrew ripped through in the 90s, they strengthened building codes and made them a lot stronger. You know, building codes can make people's eyes glaze over, but they're really important. And you write that the UN predicts that the total floor space of buildings globally will double in the next four decades. Mind-blowing. A lot of that happening, of course, in China and developing countries. Is there a place for national standards in decisions that are typically and understandably often made at the very local level? Yes. Under our constitution, state and local governments get to choose how and where they build. But when they're going to use federal taxpayers' money, so uh, somebody's money from Minnesota to build uh, along the North Carolina shore, uh, there can be some strings attached. And what uh, the Obama administration, and I happen to lead this, was developed the very first national standard for flood. And that standard essentially said, look, if you want to take federal dollars to um, uh, build your home, support your home, you're going to have to elevate it two feet above what would normally be required so that water can wash through if you're in an area at flood risk. Interestingly, President Trump, 10 days before Harvey dumped about four feet of rain on Houston, President Trump decided to rescind that national standard. President Biden, on his very first day at office, said, no, we need that national standard. We're bringing it back. And it is now in rulemaking and will become the requirement going forward. We could do the same for wildfire, the same for heat, these other risks that are worsened by climate change to just drive better building practices. And I'll add one more thing about building. If we have strong building codes, for every dollar we spend in those building codes and the enforcing them, we save $11 in damages from a disaster. One of the resistance uh, in, on the political right in this country for a long time has been uh, reluctance to acknowledge climate as a risk because the response necessarily involves greater government intervention in the economy and from what you're just saying, perhaps federal uh, intervention. So Alice Hill, do you think that climate will necessitate a stronger federal hand in decisions because local people and local governments won't make decisions fast enough or won't um, make decisions that are in the bet that, that imply <laughs> getting bailed out by Uncle Sam later? There are Two things that I would recommend. Uh, the first is that if federal money is used, we should for sure uh, make sure that that money is spent resiliently. And the second thing that I would add is that we also need to address the market failure here. And that would mean more regulation to require companies to disclose their risk and make public what they are doing to address those risks. And I'm, it's not just the risk that we're going to move to clean energy. It's also the risk that they could get hit by a wildfire or a flood or something else. And those two pieces of regulation could have a dramatic effect on our resilience as a nation. General Bostic, after Hurricane Sandy, you worked closely with New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, and New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg. What was learned between Sandy and Ida? And, and what are some of the lessons that came out of that? And have did it bear fruit? Did it help New York, uh, which was hit pretty hard by New York and New Jersey, that were hit pretty hard by Ida? First, I want to back up. I remember going into the Situation Room May of 2012, and President Obama looked at all of the uh, FEMA and me and, and, and Department of Energy he says, I'm really concerned about a storm hitting the Northeast Coast, and I want you all to get prepared. I, I don't want the electricity knocked out and flooding in New York City. And, and then in October, a hurricane hit, and 
And I thought, wow, how, how did he know that was going to happen? And he probably didn't, but he, he did know that we were at great risk. Um, but one of the great lessons for me, and I've learned this over and over, um, is is the leadership matters. And, and what President Obama did was he was there in FEMA. Uh, he was on video teleconferences talking to the governors and to the mayors. He, he was on the ground with Governor Christie and Governor Cuomo and, and Mayor Bloomberg. And so, so part of this is leadership and, and making sure the leader is taking charge and bringing the interagency. But then that leadership works all the way down to the local level from the state to the mayors, and it's integrated uh, at every level with all the agencies in the department. When I think about resilience, I think of four stages, plan uh, for disruption, absorb that disruption, bend but don't break, uh, recover, and then adapt. And when you adapt, you, you adapt even stronger because of those lessons learned. So one of the planning factors is, as Obama said in that, uh, that, that meeting in May, uh, stock up on generators, stock up on pumps that you need, uh, hydraulics, uh, do the kind of planning that's necessary. You're not going to plan for everything, but do those types of works. And then when you res- respond, um, respond quickly. I-, I remember him saying, I don't want you to wait for the governor to ask for something. You think about what he or she needs and you move out with those resources. And when they ask, you can quickly turn and, and execute. So that's that's what we did. Where we have challenges, I think, is on this this adapt. When you look at something like Katrina or the Mississippi River River tributary system that I talked about, when we adapted, we learned lessons. We invested a lot of, of, of funds that we were stronger than we were for Betsy. We were stronger now than we were for Katrina. I think when you look at New York City and the coastlines and other places, where the amount of money that has to be invested, the amount of teamwork that has to occur, it did not, in my view. And the amount of resilience that we have to build in these communities just didn't occur. And a lot of that is funding. There's never going to be enough money to go around um, if you try to do it in in the public space. We have to bring the private sector into this this fight, and and they're willing to do it. Ellis Hill, uh public-private partnerships sometimes make me a little nervous or suspicious when I'm thinking about for, you know, profit motives and things. I'm curious about your thought about you know, whether profit-driven enterprises have a role in resilience, and can the public really trust that? Well, there will always be a role uh, if there's a return on investment. So uh, that will be the key question. And where there is a return on investment, as General Bostic has mentioned, uh, I think PPPs, public-private partnerships, could be a terrific method for raising more money to do some of these projects. A challenge, of course, is that some of these projects, there's no interest in the private sector in doing this work, but it's still necessary to get it done. As we get toward the end here, what are some examples of successful planning and cooperation that achieve the kind of resilience we need? Alice Hill, you mentioned in your book the UN Water Courses Convention that 30 nations signed on to, uh, for example, where the countries are coming together. So what are some models of coming together uh, successfully to address climate? Well, we have uh, in the Arctic, you know, we have an ocean opening up for the first time uh, since Christopher Columbus uh, crossed uh, into the United States, or not the United States, to America. And that, of course, has generated lots of interest among many countries. And we're seeing fish uh, move further north as the waters warm and the fisheries uh, could grow uh, in bounty. So nations came together to protect that area against predatory fishing until we had an opportunity to work it out, what our understanding will be about that new ocean. We have similar agreements between countries uh, with regard to changing fisheries uh, to adjust that. In the Netherlands, that country decided, similar to what General Bostic has described, they have a room for the river project that lasted for 10 years that actually resulted in people moving out of areas so that those areas could be flooded to save cities. So there are examples of 
communities, people coming together to make decisions that leave everyone better off in the long term. Alice Hill worked on climate change issues at the Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Council in the Obama administration. She's now a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Tom Bostic is a former commanding general of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Tom and Alice, thank you so much for sharing your insights today on Climate One. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. What a pleasure. Coming up, Miami's Republican mayor weighs in on the politics of climate action. You know, what makes us unique and, and great is that we have an incredible environment that we can enjoy and that becomes part of a legacy that we should be giving to our children. That should not be partisan. That should not be political. And frankly, in terms of government resources, that should be a priority. That's up next when Climate One continues. In 2019, citing the Paris Climate Agreement, the city of Miami declared a climate emergency and urged the state of Florida and the United States to do the same. Mayor Francis Suarez says that emergency continues to be taken seriously today. We not only declared a climate emergency, but we then followed that up on Earth Day uh, by um, joining C40. Uh, and pledging carbon neutrality. Uh, this last Earth Day, we actually unveiled our car carbon neutrality pledge. Uh, so we are taking affirmative uh, steps uh, to create uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, in addition to um, a $200 million, uh, $200 million resiliency plan and an adaptation plan. And I think the other thing that we want to do and have a conversation about is something that doesn't get talked about very much, which is reversal. You know, how do we as a, a community, how do we as a world try to reverse some of the effects of climate change so that um, the world that we give our children is a better world than the one that we've inherited? Miami-Dade recently rejected a proposal to protect coastal areas from hurricanes by building tall, some thought really ugly concrete walls through some neighborhoods. The county plans to work with the Army Corps to come up with a new plan, likely ones involved natural solutions and mangroves, which are mentioned on the City of Miami website. So what are the strategies you'd support to make your city both protected and in increasingly in resilient to powerful storms? Well, you know, unfortunately, we are seeing more and more powerful storms. And I think the uh, Army Corps of Engineer study and, and proposal, uh, while maybe well thought out from an engineering perspective, uh, I'm not sure was socialized as, as, as much as it should be um, in order to, to obtain something that is well engineered, but also coherent and cohesive with, uh, with what our, our residents want. And so I think that's the process that we're going through. Uh, I, I would not necessarily characterize it as a rejection. I think we certainly want the resources and we understand that we need the resources uh, for uh, you know the impending storms uh, uh, that should be coming in the future that seem to be oftentimes uh, growing in intensity and in strength. Uh, but I will say that, you know, something that people don't often know uh, is that, you know, uh, cities like New York have suffered more hurricane damage than Miami in the last uh, 10 years. So, you know, we have become extremely resilient uh, to storms since Hurricane Andrew. Um, that was a, a major storm in 1992. Um, and we've had uh, some storms since then, uh, last one being Irma which produced a significant storm surge. And so I think it, they, it creates new challenges, right? And, and the challenge now is to not be as wind resilient. Now our challenge is to be water resilient. Um, uh, water is, is a challenge that is, uh, uh, you know, unique for cities like Miami because it comes from below, it comes from the sea, and it comes from the sky. And so we have to um, be creative in, in terms of the solutions that we have, which is why I think we've re, re, you know, received a global acclaim for some of our solutions uh, that we've already uh, positioned and some that we're hopefully going to enact soon. I was in Miami in 2019 on my way to Cuba and marveled at how much waterfront property development is happening. I think one area was like Miami's tallest uh, skyscraper right there, surrounded by water on about three sides. So help me understand how more property development in a city, which you just described, water coming from above and below and everywhere, um, knowing what we know about the climate science for Miami, help me understand the economic wisdom of that property development all along the waterfront. 
Well, it's a bet on the future of Miami. I think there are some that, uh, for whatever reason, feel that Miami will not exist in 10 years or in 20 years or in 50 years or in 100 years. Uh, And that's, you know, certainly not an acceptable outcome for me. I was born here. I'm the first mayor of Miami in the 125-year history that was born in the city of Miami. My children were born here. And I intend uh, to create the kind of city that my children's grandchildren uh, can live in. So it's, it's it's, it's an existential issue. It's not one that we're putting our head in the sand and denying, but it is one that we feel confident that we're dedicating significant resources to more than probably any other city in the planet. Uh, and we're doing it in a, in a thoughtful, uh, proactive way so that Miami can be here forever. That is our motto. That is our, our, um, that is our brand. And so, uh, you know, I think the fact that the development community continues to build high rises near the, the ocean it's, it's a resounding um, uh, vote of confidence in, in our leadership, in our strategies, and in the resources that we're dedicating to fight uh, uh, these issues. And uh, it sounds like it's a, it's a bet, as you say, though some people have questioned at some point whether banks will write mortgages f- for the kind of property being developed. Personally, yesterday, um, I received a notice from my insurance company that they are they are withdrawing, canceling my homeowner's insurance because of wildfire risk north of San Francisco. So who pays and, and what's the role of government and federal dollars? Is, is Miami going to expect Uncle Sam to come in and bail you out for these bets that property developers are making? Well, it's not Uncle Sam. Remember, Uncle Sam is funded by uh, by Mr. and Mrs. Smith and Suarez, right? <laughs> We're the ones that pay the taxes that go to the federal government. And they go to the federal government precisely for infrastructure issues like this. You know, I, I've been very vocal supporter of many of the things that are in the inf- current infrastructure bill. Um, we also had a, a voter-approved tax in the city of Miami. How often do you hear that uh, in any uh, part of the country where voters actually voted to increase their taxes, actually in, in this particular case, not to not to phase out a tax that already existed so that we could dedicate hundreds of millions of dollars to this issue. So voters in Miami are very conscientious of it. Ironically, the vote happened a few months right after Hurricane Irma came. So it was very sort of providential in a way that the, that an impending threat came right before an election. Uh, and, and yes, I do think the federal government and the state government should uh, do their part, should match what local governments are doing. Um, and frankly, we've gotten a, a lot of state support. Well, our stormwater master plan, which takes into account sea level rise, it was also unveiled this year uh, by my administration, was in, un, unveiled with st- significant state dollars that helped us pay for that plan. So we are planning for the future. We're dedicating resources. We're not putting our head in the sand. Uh, and and it's, it's imperative that we do that and that we do whatever it takes because I would want nothing more than to prove all those people wrong, frankly. And Miami's climate plans mention that climate impacts fall disproportionately on vulnerable people. Yet climate gentrification is a challenge in Miami as property developers move into neighborhoods at higher elevations. Uh, I walked around Little Haiti a couple years ago with activist Valencia Gunder. Liberty Square threatens to displace people from a housing project. What are you doing to protect vulnerable communities from climate gentrification in Miami? Well, I think first you have to take a step back and understand that gentrification is a real issue in urban America, right? It's it's a real issue that's divorced from whether it's climate gentrification or technology gentrification. You know, before we had this technology movement or before, uh, you know, the climate gentrification issue really was um, sort of looked at and thought of as a real phenomenon, we had gentrification. Um, and, and in the case of climate gentrification, I think we're the only city probably in the world, certainly in America, that has actually set up a fund uh, to try to prevent people from being gentrified because of a climate change and the impacts on their homes. So we set up a fund where people could get grants from the city of Miami to upgrade their homes in a resilient fashion, roofs, impact windows, and it's a grant. So it's it's forgivable so long as you don't sell your home. So that's where you sort of tie the grant to gentrification. Um, and, and we want people to have the option and the ability to stay in their homes to maintain the rich diversity of our traditional neighborhoods. We obviously can't force them to do that. Uh, but this is one way where we're helping them get the resources they need to make sure that their homes uh, are resilient without them having to sell their homes if they don't feel like they want to. 
Earlier this summer, we talked with Dr. Cheryl Holder, a member of the Miami-Dade County Heat Health Task Force, about the wide-ranging health risks of extreme heat. The Miami City website notes there's 25 dangerous heat days a year in Miami, and that could increase to 100 by 2050. So what is Miami doing to make your citizens more resilient to that kind of dangerous heat? First thing that we're doing is we are um, actually in our budget. And it's something that came uh, out of a lot of conversations in our monthly mayor's resiliency forum with activists in our community. We're increasing the budget for our resiliency uh, department. Um, we're actually adding positions uh, and growing that budget and, and making it a greater and greater priority in terms of the different uh, variations of not just heat, but for example, the health of our bay, uh, which is something we've been, we've been struggling with. Uh, and it is an impact of the heat as well, because we know as the tr- temperatures rise in the bay, um, the, it deoxygenates the water. Uh, so we've had fish kills. Uh, we've had issues with our sea uh, seagrass uh, that, uh, you know, has it's diminished significantly uh, over a period of, of, of decades. Uh, and these are challenges that we have to get come together as a community. And we're also seeing um, some a lot of runoff from construction sites into the bay. Um, and so those are issues that we really need to focus on and tackle, which is why we're dedicating more resources and collaborating with Miami-Dade County as we have with the uh, with our resiliency plan, uh, you know, which which we developed together as a community with the county and Miami Beach. Florida has struggled to contain their coronavirus since the pandemic began. What has been the what has the COVID pandemic revealed about how prepared Miami is for increased disruption of life? You know, systems. We have two crises here: COVID and climate. So, what is that? How are you dealing with that? I think a big part, uh, sort of the new buzzword, of course, uh, in our world is resiliency. And I think that's an important buzzword, right? Because it, it talks about how do, how do cities, how do people deal with shocks? How do they deal with stresses? How do they deal with disruption? Uh, and I think uh, many cities will thrive or suffer based on how they answer those questions. So as, as a city, we're trying to create a more diverse economy. Uh, we certainly are, as I said, making investments in, in uh, our resiliency from a physical perspective. Um, and we're trying to create uh, healthier ecosystems uh, economically uh, to make sure that everyone in Miami has an opportunity to be successful. Uh, and I think that's what's going to create the kind of city that can be used as a national model. Tech executives and property developers were big contributors to your reelection effort this year. And observers say you have a political future beyond Miami. You may lead later this year the U.S. Conference of Mayors. As a Republican who's acting on climate, how do you see the politics of climate in Florida and beyond? Well, I think they have to be depoliticized, right? Uh, the climate should not be a political issue. It should not be a partisan issue. It should be a, a, a solutions-driven issue. And I often say that the environment... Um, is not antithetical to the economy. The economy is the environment. Uh, in, in Florida and in Miami, uh, our, our economy is inextricably linked to our environment, um, whether it be a clean drinking water, whether it be um, enjoying the bay and all of the economic activities that result from having a, a clean bay and having a clean uh, and thriving a coral system, uh, you know, uh, we just, we're not separated. Uh, you know, what makes us unique and, and great is that we have an incredible environment that we can enjoy and that becomes part of the legacy that we should be giving to our children. That should not be partisan. That should not be political. And frankly, in terms of government resources, that should be a priority. Um, so I, I think for me, uh, irrespective of party, um, I think that's the message that I want. And I think it's also a, a generational thing. I think, uh, you know, I, 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 my generation sort of the one that comes after me, very, very vociferous on climate, very, very climate um, sensitive. And I think that's something that um, will hopefully bode well for the future of our world. Is the Republican Party out of step with millennials on climate? You know, it's interesting in Florida, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've gotten a lot of support from a Republican legislature and a Republican governor, maybe counterintuitively. Um, you know, I think the, go- the governor has been good on the Everglades and on Everglades restoration, um, you know, and, and our legislature gave us the funding to update our stormwater master plan and it was a Republican legislature. So, and they've done things on, on, on the resiliency front to get us some funding for resiliency projects. So I actually think in Florida, uh, I don't think it's as partisan an issue because I, I like I said, I think it's, I think the, the issues are so intimate connected to our economy. Maybe in other parts of the country, that's a bigger problem or a bigger issue. Uh, but I think that there's certainly a, an effort by people like myself and others 
um, to, to, to highlight to the Republican Party why this is an issue that if they care about winning elections, they better be conscientious about it because voters, young voters, millennials, as you say, um, this is one of their top issues. And uh, it may not be a top issue for someone in a, in a different generation, but it certainly is for them. Yeah, I'm not sure that message has got to Rick Scott and Marco Rubio, but what I see, I hear what you're saying about uh, the state and local. In 2018, you were named to the Global Commission on Adaptation, led by former UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon. Miami shares concerns with some island nations about sea level rise and severe storms. So, does that give you insight or empathy to those countries as we go into uh, the Glasgow Climate Summit, where those countries Countries are asking for more of a voice on a problem that they didn't really create, but they're most at risk to, uh, to be harmed from. There, there's no doubt. And I, I think it's interesting in terms of my career. Um, I've had an opportunity to be the president of the um, Miami-Dade League of Cities, which is a conglomeration of large and small cities, of diverse cities. And then now to be president potentially of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, it also gives you that same flavor for how larger cities impact smaller cities, how rural areas impact urban areas, right? And so I think uh, what, what you're describing is a very fair uh, request on the part of these some of these smaller nation states that don't have the resources, just like some smaller cities don't have the resources to have a resiliency officer. We have to step up as a bigger city and we have to provide some of that long-term planning, some of the resources, uh, you know, some of the vision uh, and the execution mechanisms that they may be able to piggyback off of, but don't have the resources themselves to create. So I think that's part of being a community. And I think we have to look at ourselves beyond our boundaries. We, and I think that's why it's important that we join C40 because as cities, we may not be able to control everything the federal government does, but we can lead. And I think it's imperative for us to lead from a moral perspective, from an action item perspective, which can lead to a lot of action at federal uh, and, and, and state levels. But I will say it's been a wonderful uh, experience to be on the global, uh, which was a commission. Now it's a council and I, I remain on the council. I'm the only U.S. mayor on the council. So it's been a, an incredible experience to be with the secretary general, to be with the former or with the current um, president of the, of, the, of the World Bank or the IMF, uh, Cristalina Georgina, and so many other uh, uh, high ranking uh, government officials throughout the world that are concerned with climate change, adaptation and food shortages and, and some of the other potential conflicts that can arise at, as a result of, of, of increasing temperatures and, uh, and inc increasing carbon in our atmosphere. Well, Francis Suarez, mayor of Miami, uh, I look forward to speaking to you again in your role, potential role as head of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. We'll be watching those bets on Florida uh, economy and property. Thank you, Mayor Suarez. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. On this Climate One, we've been talking about preparing for a climate resilient future today. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard and difficult and awkward. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review or telling your friends about our show. It really does help open up and advance the climate conversation. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Ariana Brocious is our producer and audio editor. Our audio engineer is Arnav Gupta. Our team also includes Steve Fox, Kelly Pennington, and Tyler Reed. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>